Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second NCORE Connect and Explore webinar. Uh, my name is Todd Phillips. I'm the director of the Coordinating Center for NCORE, and we're happy to have you today. If you are new to NCORE, uh, it's a public-private partnership among CDC, NIH, USDA, and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, that was formed to accelerate progress in uh, reducing childhood obesity here in the U.S. Uh, we're excited you could join us today, uh, so let's get started. Everyone on the call today is muted, so if you need technical assistance or have a question for one of our speakers throughout the call, uh, there is a chat box to the left of the arrow you see on the screen. You can type in any question uh, in that box, and one of our representatives will uh, make sure it gets asked, or if you have uh, technical assistance needs, they'll make sure to take care of you. So, uh, jumping into today's program, we've got an exciting lineup for you today. Uh, first, we're going to <clears throat> excuse me, have Dr. Pat Crawford from the University of California um, at Berkeley do our spotlight feature, which is on a deeper dive into childhood obesity declines, which I'm sure many of you have been hearing about and reading about this past year, and it's very exciting. Uh, following up on that session, Elaine Arkin is going to moderate a panel uh, to discuss research policy and local practice perspectives of these declines. Uh, we're going to be following that with two um, announcements of funding opportunities and then wrapping up with a discussion of <clears throat> a key hot topic, uh, which is on USDA's National Household Food Acquisition and Purchase Survey, affectionately known as Food Apps. So on to our spotlight feature. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Pat Crawford. Uh, she's the director of the Atkins uh, Center for Weight and Health at the University of California, Berkeley. So Pat, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Todd. Uh, it, after it's really exciting to be here. Um, after so many decades of um, unprecedented increase in child overweight and obesity, we may be reaching a plateau and in some cases a decline. And we in the field need accurate estimates of the prevalence and severity of childhood obesity for policy decisions, for researchers, and for action. So today I'm going to tell you about four different studies that will help us understand this recent change in pediatric obesity. The first two studies by Ogden and Skinner uh, use the national data set, the M. Haynes data set. The study by Madsen uses some California data. Um, and the final one is the PEDNAS data from the CDC. So those will be our, um, our sources for today that we will discuss. So. Let me be clear, one reason that NCORE created this webinar is the lack of clarity due to the multiple studies and the multiple interpretations, and I'm sure you all saw this and just threw up your hands as I did and said, oh, we have to make sense of this for the public because it's confusing to any of us. So moving on then, the... Um, the way I like to begin is to look at the graph which illustrates the time trend in child obesity that comes from the data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, the NHANES. And as you see, the, the last uh, uh, information here that was uh, published this year from for 2011 and 12 is added. And so while the increases appear to be slowing, the prevalence of obesity remains high. That was for 6 to 11-year-old children, and this is for 2 to 5-year-old children. This is the area that is the most contentious right now on whether we see a slowing in these younger children. Now, from the naked eye, the prevalence rates at that last time period, 2011 and 12, look good. But what we're going to do right now is we're going to look a little bit more closely at that data. So the four studies, as I mentioned before, um, are these here. And you can see that um, the first two using the nationally representative stratified probability sample in the U.S. Um, so we have M. Haynes used for the, the two of them, um, slightly different time periods. Um, 
We also see the third study, the Madsen study, a different time period yet, 2001 to 2008, um, with all children in California. So instead of a sampling of, of children, as done in N. Haynes, this is fitness gram data that is taken for all children every year in fifth, seventh, and ninth grades. So that's over 8 million children. So that is the first big difference, and we'll come back to that. And then the CDC data, the PEDNAS data, um, and as, as many of you know, that stands for Pediatric Nutrition Surveillance System, which is a public health surveillance system that describes various nutritional uh, indicators of low-income children, and these are children who attend federally funded maternal and child health programs. So much of this data uh, comes out of WIC for low-income children. So this is a different look at the data because it's only for low-income children, and in this case, uh, it's a two- to four-year window. So I, I'm apologizing for the speed with which I go through these studies, but you'll find information on these studies that you can look at afterwards, or you're certainly welcome to um, ask questions, uh, you know, type in questions as we go along, too, if I'm, if I'm going too fast. Um, but let's start with the first study then, the Ogden study and her authors. They looked at unadjusted changes in child obesity from 2003-4, Now, I circled here in red um, the information for the two- to five-year row of children. So it shows when you look at the p-values in the right-hand column, the one circled in red is the only p-value that approaches significance. The others... For the other age ranges, you do not see significant trends in um, obesity from those two, from the early to the later time period. So what does that mean? It means that from this data, it appears that the prevalence was 13.9 in the early time period, circled in red, and it became 8.4% of the two- to five-year-olds in the later time period. It appears to have gone down. So moving on to a little interpretation then, Ogden herself um, stated that this is um, because this analysis did not adjust for multiple comparisons. These results should be interpreted with, with caution. These data are really borderline or possibly significant. Um, she uh, also said that obesity prevalence in children remains high, and overall there was no significant change in the prevalence. So while she didn't focus on that, um, that two- to five-year-old number that we saw, um, there was a reason, because it was borderline and it's unadjusted data. Um, so it, it means that we should keep an eye on it. But when you think about the numbers in NHANES, too, it, it's not, I mean, it's a nationally representative sample, but when you divide it by the number of children in, at each age by boys and girls, it's about a little over 100 of each. So it's taken from a smaller group, and it, and it, and it really uh, should be viewed with caution. Um, and she was very clear to say that in the article, but of course the press and everybody was very excited because it looked like something that we should all pay attention to. I think it looks like more than it really is. Um, but it, we're all happy when the, when the uh, rates begin to level and we're really excited when they go down. So we're, we're going to be following this at the next time period and really excited to see what will happen. Now, this is the next study um, done by Skinner and co-authors using exactly the same data, but they used more data. They went all the way back to 1999 to 2000, and the big difference is that they adjusted uh, the, data, the analyses, and they used a different methodology. So they did not find, when they looked at the two- to five-year-old period, a significant decline in obesity. So it... It could be, it, it certainly is a result of both issues, of going back farther in time. As you can see, the rates were, were lower then, and then they, they went up somewhat. And these are rates for, by, um, I should mention that the top line, the solid line, is for the overweight. The next line is for the obesity. And then those two lines down at the bottom are for more severe obesity, uh, class three being the most, most obese children. 
And as you can see, something new is happening here with Skinner's uh, analyses. You see uh, a significant increase in obesity, <clears throat> especially in the, the most obese children. Uh, so this is important to look at it in terms of the degree of overweight and obesity, <clears throat> um, and also to look at the, the different um, trends by age group where Skinner did not find um, uh, declines in obesity. So this is where some of the, the problem came, that we have two different interpretations. And I think when you see it this way presented, you can see how obesity and overweight seem to go up at that 2003 to 4 period. So it looks, and that's the period that was used by Ogden. So it does appear that it is decreasing if you start at that time period. So clearly, these kinds of data that come out um, need interpretation. And that's what I know all of you do and what we spend our time doing is trying to, to frame that. So let's move on um, to Skinner's some of the comments uh, made by the uh, you know by the authors that although the rates were not significantly different in the last two time periods, all classes of obesity have increased over the last 14 years. So that's the overweight obese and then the more severe obese. In recent years, we've seen signs that obesity rates are stabilizing, and unfortunately, the author said there's an upward trend of the more severe. Problems. So the, the third study then of the California children, how does that help us understand what's happening right now? Well, first of all, they didn't include young children, um, only fifth, seventh, and ninth grade children. Um, these are annual measurements with a very large database. It's about one-eighth of the children in the United States uh, that uh, had data provided in this means by fitness gram um, uh, methods. Um, and what we see from this data is we can we can look and and see how the trends seem to um, change by race ethnicity over this time period that is in question right now this this early decade uh, between well in this case uh, Madsen looked at the data between 2001 and 2008 so look at the peak year that the third column over for boys, and this is um, looking at the different ethnic groups, and you can see when the rate of obesity is going up, 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 and then when it began to decline, and it varies by race ethnicity for boys, and that peak year varies with race ethnicity for girls. So that's, you can see that next to the last. advantages of having such an enormous data set is that we can begin to look more finely at data by the different groups, especially um, American Indian and Asian children, which are often, you know, we cannot find uh, large data sets on those two population groups. And we find that it's very important to look at the different groups. So having another study like this can really contribute to the data in a very meaningful way. And the key point is there's been a population decline in obesity prevalence for white and Asian youth since 2005. From this study, we could see that. And we could see the obesity prevalence among black and American Indian girls continuing to increase during that time period. It did not peak during that time period. It continued to rise. And then we saw the plateau occurring for Latino youth. So the important takeaway from this study that I think can help us better understand the national data is that health disparity may be increasing during this time when we're beginning to see plateauing and even some declines in, in certain groups. And so it's important to, to put all of these studies together, and I want to end with uh, the study, the pediatric um, surveillance data, uh, showing that in this uh, very large sample of children, we can see, as CDC reported, a decline in early childhood obesity from 2008 to 2011. The cute little trains at the end of the 
at the end of the chart, it looks like they're beginning to plateau and start to go down. So very exciting. And I should say that, um, sadly, we won't be seeing this data um, delivered by the CDC and summarized by the CDC as they discontinued serving the program in 2012. But it has been an invaluable source of data for low-income children. So this, in a, in a way, can, can also, even though it's not for the entire population, it can contribute to our understanding of what's happening, especially with the two, -year, two to four-year-old children. And we can look at this data and see how it differs by state, because it is a large data set uh, with a, over 10 million data points. So we can see that in the 43 states that have been providing this data to the CDC that uh, we're seeing a reduction in 19 of the states, a slight increase in three of the states, and a no significant change in about 21 states. So we can use this data set to better understand um, low-income children and how they're doing. Uh, and also differences by geography. So when you take all of these together and try to understand what's happening, we see that both the federal and uh, UNC studies report the same data and use similar tests, but the UNC research adjusted, used, a, used adjusted models, and then they used a longer time period, which gave a different starting point to those trends. So that's how we saw those differences. We're encouraged by signs of obesity declines, but we sh it should be tempered by concerns about increasing disparities. And continued prevention efforts are needed to sustain and expand population level interventions. We are seeing, I think we're seeing evidence that they work, but we cannot stop. Obesity remains an enormous problem. And our public health perspective doesn't change. In fact, our motivation to reduce obesity uh, is as high as ever because the rates right now are too high to sustain health and prevent diabetes and long, longer risk uh, uh, health concerns. So with that, I hand it back to you, Todd. Great. Uh, thank you so much. That's very interesting. Um, it's great to see the, the overview and, and summary of these various studies because I know it's been uh, you know, very newsworthy, and sometimes the news is not, you know, capturing these nuances or, you know, tying together the various pieces of uh, data that are coming out. So thanks for this overview. Uh, to keep going forward on this topic, I'm now going to turn it over to Elaine Markin, who's going to moderate a panel to get a few different perspectives on uh, the declines that we may or, you know, declines or plateauing that we're seeing. So, Elaine, uh, over to you. Thanks so much, Todd, and GPAT. That was really terrific. Just to step back for a minute, for those of you who have not been on these webinars before, for these one-on-one -on -one segments, we bring together experts from the childhood obesity research field and other related fields for a conversation. And today you can see on the screen that we have uh, Pat, Lisa, Tracy, and Veva, uh, uh, if you'll pardon me, ladies, um, I'm not giving all of your credentials because I think everyone can uh, see uh, those on the screen, and we're delighted to see your happy faces as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before we move into this discussion, I just want to highlight again the amount of important research being done at this really critical period in, in childhood obesity research. Pat, it was such a great job that you did of summarizing some of the larger studies that have been receiving media coverage. And But before we delve more deeply into the policy implications and the community applications of these studies, the kinds of work that Pat was saying um, is so important to continue, I just want to clarify what the public's key takeaways should be. So. Pat, if you can help us out here, uh, it was a great summary of uh, each of the studies and sort of the takeaways for us on the phone. But, you know, this is a, a, a tough issue we always face that 
Um, there's a cluster of research, but they have different data sets, slightly different methods of analysis, and cover different time periods. So, you know, if you were to get off this webinar and go to explain what, what this webinar is about to the general public, how would you be our interpreter here? How would you interpret the data for the general public? Okay, thanks, Elaine. Yes, I'll tell you what I do. I always am so excited to see the CDC updates on the unadjusted and Haynes data, and I always put it into my my ongoing graph to just kind of see where we are, and and I keep that as my contextual data from obesity beginning in 1976 on because I know they've done it the same way every time. And for me, that's really an important, you know, framing because all of the papers, when that data is released, researchers across the country are going to use it. They're going to adjust for different things. They're going to look at it. They're going to answer different questions. And those are the ones that we, you know, are are using in, in our work, too, because they're from the NHANES data. And if they're done properly, as in the case of this UNC uh, study, is excellent design really thoughtfully done, and it provides new information that's more informative in some ways on certain questions than the original study by Ogden. But Ogden's data fills an important purpose that I use, and then I do, in addition, present the other kinds of information in, you know, to the public and, 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 and share them with what I'm doing when it answers the questions that I'm specifically looking at. So, so I use them both, but I keep the one you know, kind of set aside in a special category for me to better understand the time trends because it's done the same way. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that really gives us some guidelines for how we might use this. But sort of bottom line, you know, looking at these four studies, what would be your message to the public? So my message is that uh, – that the two to four year, because that was the newsworthy issue, is that we are seeing declines in two to four year old obesity coming from the Ogden study. So my bottom line is that we're excited that we're beginning to see a reduction in the increase. We are seeing those rates going down. It's not increasing as rapidly as it had been increasing. But I think we have to take Ogden's words that you know, we are not going to say that there's a significant, you know, that's a borderline significant and it's something to watch. But no, um, from the national data, we're not seeing the declines. Neither Skinner nor Ogden uh, was willing to say that, that those are meaningful declines. So, I, so that's what I would say right now is that, and then using the other points that came out of the other papers because they are informative. Um, and add to the discourse, but the big issue was can we say it's going down in that early time period? Thanks, Pat. That's helpful. And so, Tracy, I'm going to ask you the next question because what Pat has said uh, the, that the takeaway um, is, is a, a considerably more conservative than those headlines that uh, she showed us on that first slide. So, how, uh, Tracy, should we translate the findings in the context of everything that policymakers are seeing in the environment and in the media? How, how do we translate the findings for policymakers? What do we want them to to understand, and what do we want them to do about it? So, well, thanks, Elaine, and Pat, thanks for your great overview of what could be, you know, I think one-day sessions on each one of the studies separately. So I think you did a great job of highlighting the main takeaways. I think I'd probably step back first, and, and because we're always struggling with data collection resources and people not really placing a lot of importance on the data collection because it's so mundane and it's data collection and it's not really sexy and glitzy and glamorous, but I would probably first step back and say just this level set here, we have these amazing data sets that are painting an important picture for us, so we need to continue to fund these efforts that really give us the backbone of moving forward in any kind of policy, environmental, community-based approaches. So I'd probably just kind of remind the policymakers that these numbers don't just come from 
the air and that they really are based on a lot of um, hard work that takes resources to continue to fund. And that's why things like PEDNET that, you know, are at risk for not being funded um, down the road are really a concern. So I'd probably get that message first that we need to invest in the infrastructure, which is basically collecting the data to begin with. And then I would really kind of take it at the 30,000 foot level to say these findings are promising, but, and I would probably use some of the graphs in a very specific way to show how significant the increase really has been since the 70s and how, 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 um, positive the at least the leveling off or in some cases the decreases, but how in comparison to where we were in the seventies, we have a long way to go to get back to there. So I do think I would use graphics. I would visually display it in a very easy way. I would say the important thing is we're able to collect this data. We're seeing a little bit of positive trend lines in certain cases, but I'd also call out where we're not seeing the positive trend lines. I mean to th- that we are even seeing increases in um, the most severe cases of obesity among children is alarming and startling. And I think that we need to kind of level set some of the positive trends with some of those real, real um, not positive trends. So do a little bit of both. And then depending on the policymaker, I would also put in there the importance of continuing to fund public health approaches, changes to the whip food packages, I bring in all of those areas that we've seen really positive um, transformations in to make sure that we remind them this is one of the many reasons why we may be seeing some of these leveling off. That's great, and it sounds like a a great set of uh, to-dos for policymakers, Tracy. Thank you. And and one of the things that you pointed out is to to, to continue to support um, interventions, and and as we all know, when you're talking to policymakers as well as to the public, the the other thing that really gets their attention is storytelling. So we want to switch gears just a little bit now and talk to. Uh, both Veva and Lisa, who've agreed to uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on in communities that have seen some declines. So, Veva, first, um, you're up. Um, I know that you're with the Central California Regional Obesity Prevention Program. And can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing and Maybe there's small, but some significant declines that are being seen in California and uh, how these research findings are seeing affect your work as you move forward. Thanks for the question, Elaine. So PROP is a partnership between community-based organizations, public health departments, and grassroots community members in California's San Joaquin Valley. Um, this is an eight-county region that's really the agricultural powerhouse of California, and unfortunately, we see a lot of disparities and a lot of chronic disease uh, prevalence in this region with diabetes and heart disease and you know other obesity-related illnesses in particular. So, it's a, a central location to try to work at obesity prevention. And we've been working in these communities around efforts to uh, create. Um, or advance policy system and environmental changes that actually increase access to healthy foods and promote uh, opportunities for physical activity. Um, we, as part of our efforts, have specifically uh, focused on trying to build the uh, community leadership so that we can have more community residents uh, being in contact with their decision makers and policy makers to suggest the type of changes and investments they need to create healthier communities. So, um, I think the you know, crop is, for, for California, an example of similar but many projects that have been working towards the same goal. And, you know, I really want to attribute that all of these efforts, I think, combined have helped us realize the declines that uh, Pat mentioned earlier. So California saw a 1% decline among children in fifth, seventh, and ninth grade uh, based on the, the data from statewide uh, fitness tests. So, in some ways, it might be more appropriate to say that childhood obesity rates have finally plateaued, which is a remarkable accomplishment given the rates have been steadily increasing for decades. Um, But when we sort of bend the diabetes curve um, that has resulted 
from these multiple efforts to improve school and uh, community food and physical activity environments, you know, we, we have to take into account that California was the first state to remove soda in schools. We've also strengthened our nutrition standards and physical activity requirements. So, for me, I think the evidence is a testament uh, to the fact that when we change policies, systems, and environments, we can realize a difference in obesity rates. Um, and I think it's also important to note that the declines are not universally experienced and that there has been uh, more of a patchwork of progress. For example, in disadvantaged communities like many in Central California, we unfortunately are not seeing the same declines as in perhaps other more affluent places of California. And, you know, something that Pat also mentioned, when we look closely at the ethnic populations, we are still seeing a very high uh, levels of obesity. So I think the lessons to be drawn uh, for us is that um, one of confirmation, you know, we're on the right track and we need to keep going. Um, we should really be looking at scaling efforts uh, that have been successful in preventing or halting obesity uh, so that we can have a larger statewide impact. Uh, we need to look more intensely in efforts to improve outcomes in low-income communities of color in particular. So, uh, you know, I want to echo that, you know, we've made progress, but that our work is certainly not done. Thank you so much, Vivian. And I'm itching to ask you questions, as I am of, of Lisa and Kat. And I want to remind everyone, excuse me, on this call that if you also have a question that you're just going to ask, please add them to the uh, chat section on the bottom left of your screen. And we want to hear from Lisa next, and then we'll have an opportunity uh, to um, answer your questions as well. So um, thanks again, um, Deva. And I want to move over to Lisa now, excuse me, from Vance County, North Carolina where there are also uh, positive declines. And in the same way, uh, can you tell us, Lisa, a little bit about what you've been seeing at the community level and, um, and what, what might be contributing to the declines and how the research might uh, affect your work as you're moving forward? Yes, well, thank you. This is a, a definitely an exciting um conversation, and we're happy in Granville and Vance Counties, North Carolina, that we've actually seen what feels like a significant decline. I use the word significant loosely there, given what we've just talked about earlier with regard to the data. I think we feel this overwhelming joy when we see these little blips of, of the downward trends, um, and then sometimes they are corrected when it comes to the smaller areas and, and small communities where our um, data, we just have to be careful about how we interpret it. So um, with that little caveat said, let me just paint a picture of um, where I sit in North Carolina. I'm at a local health department that is a district health department, so it's two counties, Granville County and Vance County, and those two counties sit just north of Durham and Raleigh, North Carolina, and touch the border of Virginia at the north. Vance County has about 45,000 population. Granville's larger with about 60,000. And we've, we have a higher level of poverty. Almost 30% of the people in Vance County live in poverty at the federal poverty level or less. And then um, the other significant thing about Vance County is its diversity. It's about 51% African American. So it's particularly interesting to me, um, someone who looks at those social determinants of health and those evidence-based interventions that we can do to try to combat obesity and other, other chronic diseases in our population and, and sort of scratch our heads and wonder, what are we doing right and what do we need to keep doing more of and what do we need to not over-interpret about the data. So um, there was more than a 16% drop in our obesity rate among young children between 2007 and 2009. There was an, another drop that was um, smaller. It was about 3% drop in Granville County. So that sort of pointed questions to us by saying, okay, well, you're doing something right because you're seeing the trends go down in these two counties, 
um, where we're seeing in North Carolina everything else really rise more significantly. So what's going on over there? Um, and so, you know, in our local health department, we are very lucky to have a team of incredible health educators like a lot of local health departments have. I get to brag on our supervisor in particular because she's also the mayor of Oxford in Granville County and is able to really leverage policy and environmental change and has been doing that for about 25 years since before I remember seeing it in the literature and talking about it. So I do think that some of our population level changes and interventions and trainings are among staff and um, momentum that we've had in our communities with our partners like the YMCA and our hospitals and our school systems and our Smart Start have made a difference. And, you know, of course we have to be cautious because we can't easily or inexpensively measure that difference. Um, but, but we are excited about what we're seeing in those trends and are still curious like you are about how can we figure out and pinpoint what about all of that is working. And I would echo a lot of what's already been said today, that it makes a big difference to have um, regularly measured and charted growth patterns from WIC that are, are telling us these things. Um, nutrition policy in the school systems has made a huge difference, especially in such a high poverty pocketed rural area in North Carolina. We have almost 97% of our young children on free or reduced lunch in the school system in Vance County. And the school board actually just this year made a change that they will just provide that um, to 100% of the students. So nutrition and school policy makes a huge difference here. So I think those are some of the things that I'm conjecturing, to use your word on the slide, about and am checking in frequently with our academic partners and our North Carolina Institute of Medicine and others to, to just sort of um, get help uh, with measuring this a little better. Thank you so much, Lisa, and wow, uh, how great it is to have a public health educator as mayor. It's a, uh, you have a real in on uh, and uh, in your communities, the communities you cover. So, um, again, I, I'd love to be asking you questions, but um, I want to go back for a minute before we open it up to um, Tracy. Um, there's been one, there have been a number of common themes as, as Lisa was just saying, uh, across the conversations here, and that's always comforting. Um, it, clearly a lot of emphasis on health disparities and populations who have the greatest needs. 97% of the kids in Vance County on reduced to free school lunch. That's pretty, uh, amazing. So, Tracy, are the studies that are coming out, um, sufficiently helping us understand ob obesity-related disparities? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And I mean, I'm, I'm afraid that my answer is probably, well, it's actually twofold. I think the headlines are not helping people fully understand the disparity um, numbers at all. I think the studies themselves do, but when you're writing a headline, when you're writing a press release, you have limited ink space, and so you're going to highlight and call out what you think is kind of the most significant, you know, either alarming, good or bad um, number. So I do think that um, there really hasn't been, and that's why I thought past overview of the four studies to take a look at putting everything in context, ferreting out, especially from the California numbers, some of the differences in obesity rates. Um, in different population groups, and I think that that hasn't come out oftentimes in the headlines, and I do think there's a real need to double down on really communicating the numbers by different population groups because while it might be great to see obesity decreasing across the board, what we have seen is that because it might be decreasing a little more significantly among white children that might mask that it is actually increasing among, like we saw, Hispanic and um, black, I'm sorry, black and American Indian girls. So I do think that, that we do need to be a little better at communicating those numbers to policymakers and to the public in general because I think it's easy to say, well, not, we're kind of not so, et cetera, et cetera, but um, there's a lot more that needs to be presented. 
unravels to take a closer look. So I think the answer is, frankly, no, we haven't done a good job in really communicating some of the um, some of those numbers more clearly and, and really raising the alarm flag a little bit more on that. Okay. Well, thanks, Tracy. And, and uh, Pat, I think you have something uh, to say about this, too, as we're looking at the question on the screen. Is there more research that we need to be doing to look at disparities in childhood obesity? Oh, absolutely. Following for, up from Veva and Tracy, I mean, I think racial, ethnic, and income disparities in the rates are our biggest concern right now. I mean, we know that population approaches work. Uh, they, you know, we saw with the competitive food standards in California, we could see the obesity rates change in 2005. But why? Why is it different for different groups? What is it in the community that's different? We need to really dig deeply. We can't let this continue. We need to understand it. I mean, is there a difference in the in the culture and the you know the foods that you know the activity patterns? I mean, what you know? I just don't think we have a a clue. I mean, we certainly have some you know some leads on this. So it, it's you know not that we don't know where to look. I just think we need to dig deeply because. It's more than the burden of obesity. It's even more than the extra burden of diabetes that these children have, and they do, and the heart disease risk factors. I mean, health impacts their, their, very, their learning, their job opportunities, their entire life course. So I feel we have an ethical obligation to not leave these children behind when we move forward with our, you know, and we're really excited about changes and improvements in obesity that that we spend and do our due diligence to to make sure we're all moving together on this. Great. Thank you, Pat. And I think you've laid out some of the research agenda right in that answer. So before we take questions from the uh, audience, I want to uh, turn to each of you have been in this discussion, um, and you all have slightly different roles. And so from your point of view, how can the research that is coming out, and hopefully more research to come, uh, be applied to the field and uh, in, the, in the way that you work? And is there any role that NCOR should be playing in that? And, Beth, I'm going to start with you. And we're, we're running out of time, so I'll ask you each to do this quickly. Um, yes. Uh, so I think for me, um, advocating for policy change does require evidence to convince our decision makers. Um, and so you know, that's, that's a very strong uh, need for us to be able to show, you know, when we've done these policy systems and environmental change, how it's changed behaviors and, and improved um, health. So, so that's very important. I think the other area for us is that actually getting information back to community members in terms of these disparities um, is very powerful for helping to move um, social change in mobilized communities. So that would be a, another area that I think would, would help us on the sort of advocacy policy changes. Great. Thank you, Vivian. And, and Lisa, how would you build on that? Yeah, well, I think the more brief answer I'll try to limit myself to is, is helping more with translation of the research. Uh, that's sort of the position I feel like so many of our colleges, universities, and funders end up really helping local public health and practitioners with is, is being able to do webinars just like this and other ways to distribute the data, information, and research that will help guide our decision making at the local level. So it's not just those policymakers, but also the practitioner level that, that needs a little bit of hand-holding sometimes. Absolutely, and thank you for that reminder. And Tracy, what about you? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that I would totally concur with um, what Viva and Lisa said. I think the only other thing I would, I would add is stepping back a little bit. I think it will be important to, um, to basically connect researchers with advocates kind of before the research is started. I, I have, I'm sure many of you have examples of, gee, that's a really nice piece of research. I can't use it at all. It is not either the right timing. It is not the right 
message that I need to be sending right now. It is basically just not the right type of research I need to advocate for a policy change. So I think even at the beginning, before research is undertaken, there may be a need to sort of level set and see what's the landscape, what's going on in the policy world, what would be the most helpful to move policy and environmental change. A really important reminder, particularly since we have such limited uh, resources to do that research. Pat, what about you? Okay, well, I'd like to highlight the importance of working in schools. As you know, 50%, up to 50% of the calories are consumed there, and right now we have an opportunity we've never had before to put in place really strong competitive food standards and school meal standards. And if we can help them hold the line and, and really put those in place without diluting them, then I think we have the opportunity to study the impacts and see dramatic decreases to childhood obesity. And we need to study it and then share the results with policymakers and show them that what we all know is true, that when you provide children with healthy foods over time and with a little encouragement, children do eat what is available to them, and school is just a beautiful opportunity to improve children's health. <laughs> well, that certainly makes sense, and uh, that would be a great study to see. So thank you all so much for that. It's really useful to get that feedback uh, for uh, NCORE members and the other folks uh, uh, who work in uh, childhood obesity research who are on the line today. So now we have a, a little bit of time, uh, not much, for questions um, uh, from the audience. And um, I believe that there, the question to Lisa that came in, uh, has Lisa seen any uh, changes in the field, in the built environment to increase physical activity. And um, thank you so much, um, NCORE staff, for putting that right, that answer right in the chat box. So, uh, Lisa, is there anything that you would quickly like to add to that um, answer? Uh, just quickly, I think North Carolina did a fabulous job implementing community transformation grant work um, while it lasted and that we've certainly been working on built environment changes with joint use agreements and have had good good policy change in school and, and nonprofit partners working with us to change the built environment. So, so the answer is yes and the caveat, I mean the the thing to go with that is that we're still in a very poor, very rural area where that high poverty connects to low transportation opportunity um, to get to some centralized places for exercise. So my default answer is still that I, I think some of the nutrition opportunities were greater in this drop in the data that we saw. Great. Well, it sounds like you're making uh, good strides and, and not the easiest community to do that. So um, I think, uh, Todd, we're out of time. Um, do we have time for one more closing question or shall we move ahead? Uh, let's move ahead. And if you do have additional questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box and our speakers will look there. And if um, they can, they'll type their answer right there for your question. So that's the way we can answer your questions and keep moving forward at the same time. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, uh, for that great panel. It's, you know, really fascinating to hear the various points of views from researchers and policy folks and, you know, those of you on the ground working in communities. Um, this conversation will continue through various NCORE channels, so those of you on the webinar, uh, feel free to uh, join our e-newsletter, look at our NCORE blog. You can see the various uh, locations of these items there. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, this webinar will be posted online, and for everyone who registered, we'll be sending out an email with a link to this so you can review it and then share it with your colleagues as well. Um, and then this slide shows on our website at ncore.org under our resources tab is where you can find our webinars, uh, past ones, current ones, and future ones, and share them with your colleagues. Uh, so moving forward, uh, we do have two funding opportunities we wanted to share with you today. Uh, first, I'm going to turn it to Joanne Guthrie, who's going to talk about an opportunity uh, from the USDA. So, Joanne, you are up. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just took the mute off my phone. Can everybody hear me? We can hear you. Great. Okay, great, great. Well, going ahead then, um, just to talk about the funding opportunity, I hope that 
at least some people have already seen it, but USDA, um, my agency, the Economic Research Service, in partnership with the Food and Nutrition Service, which um, handles all of our food assistance programs, the school meal programs, and WIC, which people were just talking about, and also the um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, formerly known as Food Stamps, as well as several others. Um, we kind of came together to provide the funding, which is up to $1.9 million for a three-year award, to establish a USDA Behavioral Economics um, Center for Healthy Food Choice Research. Uh, some people here may be familiar with the previously funded um, Behavioral Economics uh, in Child Nutrition Program Center at Cornell University. Um, ERS and FNS, again, work together to fund that. And they've done a lot of work which has to do with increasing children's acceptance, their selection and consumption of the new healthier meal pattern offered through the National School Lunch Program. And I think the center's I mean, the, the department has been really happy with the center in terms of doing very practical research that can be taken out and applied and is being taken out and applied in schools nationwide to help um, achieve the goals of, of this historic change in the school year program. That center, it had a multi-pronged focus that included both research and an active dissemination program, which they carried out vigorously. They branded essentially their work as smarter lunchrooms and have worked through a bunch of partners to get it out to schools. Similarly, this um, center would have both a research and a dissemination function, but its work would complement Cornell uh, by focusing um, primarily on, the two, on two other very important programs to USDA, one of which is SNAP, and the other is WIC. And, and that together, that would be expected to be 60% of the work of the center. And then the residual could be more broadly based, being basically any food choice issue that would be relevant to USDA policies, which given that USDA is very involved with uh, the My Plate Food Guidance System, nutrition education to the general public, labeling of meat and poultry, many other things, you could imagine it's a broad base of practically every important food and nutrition issue that you could define in America. So it would certainly give a lot of scope to whatever university um, wins the award and establishes the center. So right now the RFA is out on the street. Uh, we ask people, although it's not required, as a, most, as a courtesy to let us know by the end of May if they were interested in applying. And, we're happy that we got a lot of interest. We're expecting to get excellent proposals. Uh, they're due June 30th. Uh, we'll be reviewing and making an award by um, September 30th. So this is all happening on, on a pretty fast track, and, and we're very excited about moving forward in this new area. Great. Thanks so much for that update. It's definitely exciting work and very much needed. Uh, next, I want to turn it to Layla Esposito from NIH for the next funding opportunity. Um, so this is a program announcement on home and family-based approaches for prevention of obesity in early childhood. It's sponsored by several of the institutes, as you can see. Um, it is both in the R01, which is our five-year award mechanism, and an R21, which is the two-year award mechanism, and standard um, budgets for both of those mechanisms apply. You can see the due dates. Um, the next date is October 5th for the R01 and October 16th for the R21. There's also um, February and June um, dates, and it expires in May of 2016. Um, the funding opportunity is designed to encourage research applications that will identify behavioral and environmental interventions appropriate for infant and young, young children. So we're basically talking about kids um, up to the age um, of five. Um, with the potential to improve prevention and management of overweight and obesity in childhood. Um, we're seeking 
to fund research with potential for future translation to application in either the home or linked to community settings. We're looking for applications that are proposing randomized clinical trials, testing novel interventions, um, uh, focusing on infants and young children. Um, so both observational work or descriptive studies are not appropriate for this funding opportunity. Um, really the goal of the work is to identify interventions that influence parent and child behaviors that contribute to inappropriate weight and thereby um, improve subsequent health status in childhood. Um, and the emphasis should be put on the role of the home environment and the influence of family within the home, home environment. Um, researchers should also consider um, the role of family in food and beverage consumption, physical activity practices, and sedentary behavior. Um, so um, the link is at the bottom, but if you just Google PA 13-153, it will bring up the program announcement where you can get more details, and you can also see um, scientific contacts at the different institutes if you're interested in applying. Great. Thanks so much for that. Um, we're not going to take questions right now, but if you do have anyone on the phone has questions about these funding opportunities, feel free to email us at coordinatingcenter at ncor.org, and we'll reach out to Joanne and Layla and get the answer for you. So thank you uh, to both of you. Um, our next and last uh, topic is um, to cover a, a hot topic in the field of childhood obesity, and with that, we have Mark. Mark Denbali from the USDA, who's going to talk about their National Household Food Acquisition and Purchase Survey known as Food Apps. Uh, so, Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me begin with uh, thanking uh, NCOR for hosting this uh, wonderful webinar and for inviting USDA to bring to your attention the groundbreaking resource that will become available this summer. The uh, United States is uh, among a handful of developed countries that uh, really doesn't have detailed information on food purchases of its populations. And because of this data gap, uh, many important policy issues related to food cannot be examined to better guide the decision-making process, as uh, uh, discussed earlier. To fill this gap, uh, USDA's uh, Food and Nutrition Service and Economic Research Service teamed up uh, and work with colleagues from across federal government, academia, other principal and statistical agencies uh, to design a new survey. Uh, the survey was conducted uh, by mathematical policy research and uh, under a distinguished uh, um, uh, external technical work group. The survey called the National Food Acquisition uh, and Purchase uh, Survey, or for short, food apps, breaks new grounds by collecting comprehensive and detailed information from households about all foods uh, they obtain, not consumed or eaten, uh, from all sources, whether it's free or not, uh, during one week period. Um, specifically, um, uh, food apps collect prices, uh, quantities, and nutrient contents uh, uh, from all foods uh, obtained, um, whether purchased or acquired for free, for consumption at home and away from home, including foods uh, from nutrition assistance programs, food banks, and so, so on. I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Food apps also contains a rich, rich set of information about the drivers of food choice. It includes household income and major non-food expenditures, captures their knowledge about diet, health, and nutrition, uh, their shopping behavior, such as use of uh, shopping lists or eating nutrition labels, it includes information on neighborhood access to supermarkets and other stores, as well as access to uh, uh, fast food establishments and other types of restaurants. Uh, it identifies households that participate in supplemental nutrition assistance program, women, infants, and children program, or WIC, uh, and school meal program. It also designates uh, the food security status for each household. I should also add here that uh, uh, given uh, the discussion that just preceded, uh, we have collected a uh, high weight uh, um, of all members of the households. Uh, a lot more detail is available in the links provided on this uh, page. So uh, we have uh, four targeted populations. The survey is nationally representative of uh, uh, of the nation with data from 4,826 households 
And it's representative of four distinct populations. Those who participate in supplemental nutrition assistance programs and uh, three other populations not participating in SNAP. Uh, those whose income is below the 100% of federal poverty limit. Uh, those with income uh, between 100 and 185% of federal poverty limit. And households with income above uh, the 185% uh, poverty limit. Uh, the survey is, uh, unlike any other survey, uh, it, uh, rather than recall, it relies on uh, scanner technology to capture that the hot scores actually uh, obtain. Uh, again, it covers uh, food at home as well as food away from home uh, from all sources, uh, including all groceries, uh, restaurants, school meals, vending machines, coffee breaks, banks, uh, food banks, uh, gardening, uh, fishing, game, etc. Uh, finally, to improve the data, uh, food apps relies heavily on extant data. Uh, for example, uh, the scanned UPCs uh, are matched to proprietary uh, data to get the exact quantities and attributes of food items. Uh, proprietary data also used to describe the availability uh, and the price profiles of all groceries uh, in the neighborhoods, whether they were visited or not. Uh, and then administrative data were also extensively used, also for sampling and checking data quality. Uh, and USDA nutrition data were brought in uh, and appended uh, to food items. So what can these uh, data answer? Uh, these are uh, some broad categories of questions that uh, we can't answer now. Uh, and I will give you more uh, specific uh, examples of them. For example, we will find out the, uh, we can find out the nutritional quality of the bundle of foods uh, SNAP participants buy. How does it differ from the rest of the population, especially in comparison to low-income households who are eligible for SNAP but choose not to participate? Uh, we can examine if knowledge uh, about diet and nutrition influences food choices and the nutritional quality of foods acquired. We can quantify how access contributes to poor variety, higher prices, and low nutritional quality of acquired uh, foods. Uh, and we can also uh, look at uh, the role of the SNAP participation, disability, consumer shopping competencies, uh, food access, living in higher food areas. How does it affect our choices? How does it affect food insecurity? Some uh, specific examples of how these data are already being put to use uh, uh, is that ERS and FNS collaborated uh, and issued a, um, a request for proposal uh, in, on two areas, uh, focused on uh, behavior, food choice behavior of SNAP participants and the impact of local food environment. Uh, we received uh, 60 excellent proposals, 12 of which have been uh, selected, uh, and uh, the information, the detailed information on these projects are available on this link that you hear, that you can see here. And uh, some examples of it is sort of the relationship of food price variation to healthy food acquisition. How uh, SNAP recipients, uh, whether SNAP recipients get the best prices or, uh, or not. Uh, in real times, given that the price, uh, food prices vary across regions, are SNAP benefits adequate? Uh, they're looking at uh, SNAP benefit cycle and how it affects food choices. And uh, lots of interesting uh, uh, research on the impact of local food environment on food choices and uh, the trade-off between price and availability of foods. So finally, you're asking how do I get access to the data? Well, these data are uh, uh, CC protected, and CC stands for Confidential Information Protection and uh, Statistical Efficiency Act of 2002. Uh, it is a law that federal government uh, can invoke in collecting data to respondents with the premise that the data will be only used for statistical purposes. Uh, and that uh, in doing so, access to the data will have to be uh, controlled and restricted so we can maintain and protect uh, uh, confidentiality of respondents. 
to get access, uh, one must have the approved project. Uh, we have to know what these projects are being used for, what the purpose of it is. Uh, we have to have uh, the user be CIPC certified, that uh, they fully understand what they have to do, that uh, any violation, even inadvertent violation, can result into $250,000 of fine and five years of jail. Uh, that anything that is uh, produced uh, will have to be reviewed carefully uh, and then released. And then there would be a MOU between the user and uh, USDA um, that we are all on the same page. To uh, implement all of this, uh, the data are housed at the University of Chicago's uh, North Data Enclave. Um, and uh, they have a machine, uh, referring to a uh, fan client machine, uh, that is very secure. Uh, a user would obtain one of those machines and would access the data on that enclave, uh, would do the analysis, and they will check it preliminary for non-disclosure issues and then uh, disclosure issues, and then we will examine it. Then finally, it would be it. Uh, so let me stop here and let you ask questions. Great. Thanks, Thanks Mark. Any uh, questions for Mark? If you have them, uh, go ahead and type them in the chat box at the bottom. Um, in the essence of time, we'll go ahead and, Mark, just keep an eye out on the chat box, and we'll see if any uh, come up, and you can type your answer there for those. So sure. thanks again. Uh, just, just to wrap up, uh, thank you guys for uh, staying a few uh, minutes past our one-hour allotment, but just a few key updates about NCORE. Two of our main tools for researchers, the Catalog of Surveillance Systems and the Measures Registry, have both undergone usability testing and have been updated to make finding and using them easier and faster. Uh, you can find them at NCORE.org through the Tools tab or by the rotating carousel. So if you go to our website, you can click on Tools that uh, has the star around it here, and you can see those two uh, resources for researchers. So please check them out. We've made them better than ever. Um, and for this webinar, this is our second one, so we'd love to get your feedback. Um, we have five questions we'd like to ask those of you still on the line, and they'll shape uh, how we do these in the future. So uh, at the end of the slide, we'll switch over to the feedback form momentarily. You can put in your input. Um, and then uh, we'll have that for doing next uh, Connect and Explore in, uh, in the fall. So uh, thank you all for joining us today, and thank you to uh, Elaine and all of our speakers. Uh, very informative. Um, I learned a lot on this myself about childhood obesity declines and really appreciate all your perspectives. Uh, so thanks for joining us today and look for our next webinar uh, this fall. So thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's teleconference. You may now disconnect.